It is my great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. Mark Zandi. Mark gave a great informal lecture to our students uh, last year. Mark is quoted in the Times more than any economist that I know and is actually sort of the nicest economist I know in many ways. So Mark is the chief economist of Moody's Analytics where he directs research and consulting. He's a trusted advisor to policymakers and an influential source of economic analysis for businesses, journalists, and the public. Mark has frequently testified before Congress on topics including the economic outlook, the merits of fiscal stimulus, financial regulatory reform, and for foreclosure mitigation. Mark's research interests include macroeconomics, financial markets, and public policy. His recent research has focused on the determinants of mortgage foreclosure and personal bankruptcy analyze the, um, the economic impact of various tax and government spending policies and assess the appropriate policy response to bubbles in asset markets. Mark is the author of Financial Shock, an expose of the financial crisis, and his forthcoming book, Paying the Price, provides a ro roadmap for meeting the nation's daunting fiscal challenges. Dr. Zandi received his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and received his BS from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. We forgive him for those affiliations and we very much welcome him on the stage, uh, Dr. Mark Zandi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Mishan. Right um, can you hear me? Does that work? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Good. I want to thank uh, Vishan for the opportunity to be here at Columbia as well. Uh, it is a pleasure. Um, I am a little surprised he gave me two hours to speak, though. Yeah. Nothing worse than an economist for more than, what do you think, 25 minutes? Okay, I'll speak for 25 minutes, and then we'll turn it back to you and see where you want to go. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my daughter, uh, Lily. Uh, for coming out with Dad. Uh, I knew that took uh, a bit of courage, uh, but I'm glad she's here. I'm glad she's here. She's going to hear uh, about three speeches in the next couple of days, and I promised her that the forecast would not change. You um, know, Vishan, I was, I was trying to think of how we met, and I realized that it was through your students. Uh, yeah, they, uh, I'll have to say, they're very persistent. Uh, I got an email saying, would I uh, like to speak at their class? And I say, oh, not really. Uh, but I couldn't actually say no, so I said, uh, I'm busy. Uh, get back in about three years. Uh, and, and they got back uh, and uh, wouldn't let me off the hook. And I'm so glad that they didn't uh, because uh, we now have a relationship, and I really do value that. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, I do have a PowerPoint. Um, I'm really uh, thinking I might not use it. Uh, what do you think? Should I, should I use a PowerPoint? Who wants me to use a PowerPoint? Who doesn't want me to use a PowerPoint? Uh, I think they want me to use a PowerPoint, but I'm not going to. <laughs> it's your PowerPoint. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, and if you put it up on eBay, just think of me, OK? Uh, just think of me. I'm going to make four points in my remarks. Uh, point number one, the economic recovery, and we are in a recovery, the recovery began nearly a year and a half ago, has lost a significant amount of momentum. So let me give you a number to uh, give some meat to that. GDP, the value of all the things that we produce, grew 3.3% annualized in the second half of 2009, 2.7% in the first half of 2010, and in the second half of this year, the current period, we're now growing about 2% annualized. Just to give you context, the economy's potential rate of growth, that rate of growth consistent with a stable rate of unemployment, is between two and a half and three percent. So we're not growing fast enough to create enough jobs to even keep the unemployment rate at its current 9.6 percent. The unemployment rate will rise. Uh, and I would not be surprised if it were to rise back into double digits by early 2011, spring of 2011. The slowdown in the economy that we've experienced isn't totally unexpected. Um, 
The economy early in the recovery was supported by temporary factors, uh, the most notable in a factor that's generated a great deal of debate is the fiscal stimulus. In, in my mind, the fiscal stimulus did precisely what it was intended to do. It was designed to end the Great Recession and begin an economic recovery, and that's exactly what happened. The maximum benefit from this fiscal stimulus took place in June of 2009, and that is the precise month in which the stimulus in which the recession ended, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research. Now, of course, the stimulus was never intended to be a source of long-term economic growth, and it now is beginning to fade. We went from no stimulus to a lot of stimulus, and that helped to juice up economic activity, and now we're going back to no stimulus, and in that process, the economy is beginning to slow. Uh, that should be no surprise to anyone, and if policymakers, if Congress and the administration don't come forward with any additional stimulus, and at this point in the wake of the midterm elections, that seems unlikely, then the stimulus will actually become a drag on economic activity as we make our way into next year. But that's no fault of the stimulus. The stimulus did precisely what was intended. It ended the recession. It jump-started uh, an economic recovery. But it was a temporary source of growth. I will have to say, however, that the slowdown in economic growth that we've experienced uh, since the beginning of the year is more significant than I would have anticipated. So if I were here six months ago and we were talking about the latter half of 2010, uh, I would have argued that the economy would still be struggling to uh, grow, but not to the degree that it is. And I think the reason uh, for this uh, surprising slowdown in economic activity is the European a sovereign debt crisis. That was a surprise to me. It came out of nowhere from my perspective. At least the virulence of it did back in the spring. And the link between the European sovereign debt situation and our economy is the equity market. Uh, usually the causality between the, the equity market and the, stock mar uh, the economy run in both directions. And it still does, but it feels to me like the causality is very powerfully moving from the equity market to the economy, more so than any time in the past. The businesses are using the equity market as a signal with respect to whether they should go out and invest in higher, and perhaps more importantly, high-income households are very attuned to their balance sheet. Because their nest eggs have been significantly diminished by what we've been through, they're very sensitive to any changes in that balance sheet, in their net worth, and change in stock values. And moreover, uh, enhancing this relationship between the stock market and the economy is that we, all, we are all getting a lot older. Now, here's the most important statistic of the day. In fact, Vishan, I'm going to ask you, what is the largest single-year age group in the country? There are more of these folks than any other age. Is it, is it three? Is it 83? What age is it? 45? That's wrong. That's wrong. That, 40, see, that's spoken like, that's truly what an economist would say, 45 to 65. But not a real estate professional. They want precision. They want precision. Yeah. So the answer is, how old are you, by the way, Vishan? Uh, that is, there you go. I, the, the answer is 51. 51. I, I happen to be 51. I happen to be 51. This is the teeth of the baby boom generation. There are a lot of 51-year-olds, 52, 50, 49 so forth and so on. So if you're 51 years old and your nest egg is now a third of what it was or 25% of what it was, you're focused like a laser beam on your balance sheet because you know that you don't have a whole lot of time to get it together. The other reason why the stock market is so important to the behavior of particularly high income households, and they're very important to overall consumer spending, is that people's expectations about future asset price growth have shifted. So, Vishan, if I asked you, say, think back five years ago in the boom, what would be av the average annual growth in uh, the value of your entire portfolio, your entire, the asset side of your balance sheet, how fast do you think that would, would grow? What would you say? Five years ago, we were in the boom. How much? 8%. Vishan is very conservative. Um, 
uh, but reasonable answer. Uh, pension funds would say eight and a half, but you know, eight percent is not bad. Uh, I think most Americans probably would have said 10 percent, but let's go with eight. So now, Vishan, you're here today looking forward 10 years. What do you think average annual asset price growth will be over the next 10 years? Three percent. So we went from eight percent to three percent. You're 45, I'm 51. What does that mean? That means if there's any shift in your balance sheet and the value of the assets you own, you become very, you're very quick to respond. And so when the European debt situation hit and took 15% out of the equity market, that knocked the wind out of the economy. And in my view, if we had not gotten sidetracked by the European debt situation, we would all be feeling measurably better about the economic situation today. The results of the midterm elections would have been measurably different. But we did get sidetracked, and it didn't cost us the recovery. We're still growing, but nonetheless, uh, we're growing much more slowly. The recovery is very fragile. So point number one is that we're still growing. We still have recovery, but it is the, we've lost a significant amount of momentum. The economy is growing below its potential. Point number two. How many points did I say there were going to be? 23? Four. Four points. Okay. Point number two. Oh, and by the way, my strategy here is to take you, take you down. I'm going to take you uh, low, uh, and then when you're feeling very depressed, I'm going to try to lift you higher. I'm going to try to lift you higher. So, so bear with me. Point number two is now going to take you down. Take you down. Yeah, I know you're down already. I, I, I should say two things. First of all, I run the risk of taking you too low because I've taken audiences so far down I can never get them back up. So I, I'm going to work really hard not to do that. The second thing is I am an economist. You've got to keep this in mind. And even when I'm tr speaking optimistically, it doesn't sound that way. So you have to uh, account for that bias. Point number two. The next six, nine, perhaps 12 months are going to be very uncomfortable. The economy is not going to grow fast enough to create enough jobs to even, as I said, forestall a further increase in unemployment. Unemployment is likely to rise. We're going back into double digits by early next year. I don't think we're going to double dip, but the odds of double dipping are uncomfortably high, uncomfortably high. Now, let me give you, there, there's, a, there's a multitude of reasons for this nervousness, but because I don't want to take you too low, I'm not going to go through them. Uh, I'm sure in the Q&A, the person who's very dark in the room will drag us down further by pointing out that I failed to mention one of these problems that we have. But I'm going to focus on two problems, two problems that I'm most nervous about in the next six to nine months, uh, perhaps 12 months. The first is that, uh, going back to the job market, while businesses are no longer laying off in any a significant way. The rate of layoffs are back to where you would normally expect them in a reasonably well-functioning economy. The hiring is just not there. Businesses are not hiring. Let me give you a statistic to uh, flesh that out. Prior to the recession, if you go back to 05, 06, 07, monthly hires were running somewhere between five and five and a half million per month. In the recession, hires slid. Uh, they bottomed out around 4 million hires per month, and we've been at 4 million per month since then. No change. If we're going to get the kind of job growth we're going to need to sustain just a stable rate of unemployment, we're going to have to get back closer to 5 million. And if we want job growth that's sufficient to bring down unemployment in any significant way, we're going to have to get up closer to 5.5 million. We're a long way from that. And while it's difficult to put your finger on exactly what's wrong, let me mention a couple of things that I think are really bothering businesses. The first thing is a lack of credit. Not for big companies, not for mid-sized companies, but for small businesses. Here's a key statistic. Establishments that employ fewer than 100 workers account for half of all of the jobs in the economy and two-thirds of the net job creation in the last economic expansion. If small businesses can't get credit, they can't hire, and if they can't hire, the job machine can't get going. And small businesses are still having a great deal of difficulty going down to their friendly bank and getting that loan that they need to go out and expand their operations to make that investment and to, and to hire somebody. Another reason for the lack of hiring is confidence. We're all very nervous. 
We've been through a lot. The Great Recession was gut-wrenching. I don't think any business person forgets that very quickly. I mean, I was a small business person. I started my company back in 1990. I sold, I sold it to the Moody's Corporation about five years ago, but I was a small business owner for 15 years, and I went through two recessions, and they were mild recessions, and it took me a long time to get over it. And I can't imagine as a small business person operating in today's environment forgetting what they went through or what they're still going through uh, very quickly. Uh, so it's just going to take time. The other reason why confidence is so weak, however, is, in, in this is my view, it's very difficult to document, but it's my sense of it talking to business people across the country, is policy uncertainty. You know, we have made some very epic policy decisions. Health care reform, financial regulatory reform, we've been debating energy policy, we've been debating immigration policy, we still don't know what our tax rates are going to be on January 1st. So reason number one for some nervousness about the economic recovery over the next six to nine, perhaps 12 months, is the lack of hiring. I said I was going to mention two, two things to be nervous about. The second thing is the foreclosure crisis. That is ongoing. That has not ended. Another statistic, there are 4.1 million first mortgage loans that are in default or headed in that direction, 90 days and over delinquent. There are 49 million first mortgage loans outstanding. So 8% of mortgage loans are in this predicament. That means some parts of the country it's measurably worse. In Florida, one in five mortgages are in default or close to. In Miami, uh, the default rate is close to, close to one in three. Now, I would expect that a fair share of the 4.1 million loans that are in default status or close will get some form of modification. The administration has a modification plan, private uh, mortgage company, the mortgage companies have their own private mod plans in place. Uh, generously speaking, I would anticipate a couple million modifications that will occur, but that still leaves two million plus uh, loans that will go through the foreclosure process to a distressed sale, to a foreclosure or short sale. And the key statistic with respect to housing values is the share of home sales that are distressed. If that share is rising, house prices are going to fall, and it's now very, very likely that we're going to see more house price declines over the course of the next six, nine, 12 months. Nothing really works in our economy if house prices are falling. The home is still the most important asset in most people's balance sheet, going back to my earlier point about the sensitivity that people have to the, their, their net worth. And again, going back to small businesses, most small businesses use their home as collateral when getting a loan. And again, I can testify to this, to testify to this personally as I said, I started my company in 1990 with my brother and one other fellow, and by 1993, we decided that we wanted to go out and expand, but you know, we didn't have any cash, so we needed to get a, a business loan. So I went down to my friendly bank, the bank that I had been depositing our meager sums into, and uh, they, uh, they quickly turned us down. They quickly turned us down. And then I went to my really friendly bank, the uh, community bank, Malvern Federal Savings Bank, which is still with us and doing quite well, thank you. I paid back my loan. Um, they gave me a loan. Now, of course, when I signed the, uh, when I got the loan, I had to sign a stack of papers about that high. And one part of the stack was me signing away Lily uh, to the bank. And the other was signing away my home to the bank. Now, my, I don't think my wife really understood. She had to sign too, of course. I'm not sure she really understood what she was signing. It all worked out in the end, but nonetheless, it was uh, pretty nerve wracking. But, What's my point? My point is that many small business people across the country use their homes or their commercial real estate as collateral to get that small business loan. If housing values and commercial real estate values are uncertain or under pressure, they're not going to be able to do that. They're not going to be able to get that loan, and the job machine is not going to be able to get going. Another reason for some concern. How are you feeling? Low? Depressed? I succeeded? OK. That's the conclusion of point number two. I am now going to proceed to lift you higher. Point number three. I forgot point number three. No, only kidding. <laughs> point number three. We will make it through the next six to nine months without going into recession. And this time next year when you all meet, the economy is going to be feeling measurably better. 
And when you meet two years from now, the economy is going to be off and running, off and running. Let me give you a few reasons for this optimism. And, and by the way, I should say, just one caveat, I am well outside the consensus here. If you ask most economists what they think about the next few years, they'll say, we're going to get 3% GDP growth per annum ad infinitum into the future. Which, by the way, if that's true, that means we're going to have unemployment close to 10% forever ad infinitum in the future. I don't believe it. In fact, I think GDP growth will be 2.5%, 3% in 2010. It'll be 2.5% to 3% in 2011, to my second point. But by 2012, I think we get GDP growth of 5%. 2013, 5%. Very, very strong growth. Here are the reasons for this perspective. Reason number one, this is a very near-term reason, the Federal Reserve is going to do everything it takes to make sure that we don't go back into recession. That is the uh, most important message in the revival of quantitative easing. The Federal Reserve is now going out, has announced that it's going to buy a boatload of Treasury securities, and uh, this will only be the beginning if it doesn't work. I think it will work. It already is working. Stock prices are up. Fixed mortgage rates are at record lows. Inflation expectations have firmed. The value of the dollar has fallen very modestly, but still uh, very helpful to the economy. The Federal Reserve has gotten exactly what it wanted, and it will do more if necessary. The Federal Reserve knows that the risks to the economic expansion and recovery are quite high. They know if we go back into recession, it's going to be very difficult to get out. There is no policy response. They know in the wake of the midterm elections that there will be no additional fiscal stimulus. It is on them, and they are up to the task, and they will do what's necessary. Now, I'm sure they're very, very surprised at the vitriol that's been swung their way here domestically and, more importantly, overseas. But in my view, that is misplaced, that what they're doing is precisely the appropriate thing for our country and for the entire global economy, because the U.S. economy is still 25 percent of global GDP, and if we're not growing, no one's growing. And we need to do what's right for our economy, and that is keeping interest rates down and keep stock prices up, and that'll keep this economy moving forward. And I think the Federal Reserve will continue on that path until it's abs they're absolutely sure that we're creating enough growth and jobs so that unemployment comes down in a meaningful way. So that's reason number one for optimism, my faith in the ability and willingness of the Federal Reserve to do what is necessary to make sure that we don't backtrack. Reason number two, this is more fundamental. Pick any economic statistic you want. Take a look at uh, GDP, take a look at jobs, take a look at retail sales, look at industrial production, uh, anything you want. The, each one of those statistics is still measurably below where it was uh, at the start of the uh, economic recession, except there is one statistic that is all the way back from the bottom. It's, it's even higher today than it was prior to the recession. Anyone want to venture a guess what that statistic is? Yes, sir. Productivity, uh, and that's, that's true, very true. And what is, what's the benefit of productivity? Where does that, where's the benefits of that go? Where has it gone so far? Corporate profits, right? Corporate earnings, right? So corporate profits are back higher than they were prior to the economic recession. Now, uh, the growth in corporate earnings uh, is the result of significant cost cutting. Now, all those lost jobs, clearly extraordinarily painful, and it's going to take years to get all those people back employed. But the, the benefit of that, and there is, has been a benefit, is that it has resulted in tremendously wide margins for businesses. You take those margins, you mix in a little bit of sales growth, and you get tremendous earnings growth. And right now, corporate earnings economy-wide, big companies, mid-sized companies, and even small companies, is growing 40, 50 percent year over year. Now, admittedly, against easy comparison, but nonetheless, that's about as strong a corporate earnings picture as we've seen since World War II in the data that we have back to World War II. Corporate balance sheets are in excellent shape. If you look at any measure of corporate uh, health, uh, financial health, interest coverage ratios, if you look at uh, cash on balance sheets, quick ratios, uh, we've never seen anything that comes close to how strong corporate balance sheets are. Strong profits, strong balance sheets. It's no longer, in my mind, a question of can businesses expand. 
they can. It's really a question of are they willing. It's a matter of confidence. And that is a very important distinction. A very, the necessary condition for a much better economy is firmly in place. We just need to get a little bit of confidence in deploying those resources. And in fact, here's an intrepid forecast for you. A year from now, a light switch is going to go on in corporate America. They're going to say to themselves, you know what? One CEO in each industry is going to say to themselves, you know what? I can't continue to grow earnings by cutting costs. I've done that. I've gotten all the, pro the productivity gains, the massive productivity gains that I can. The only way I'm going to grow earnings is if I take a chance, if I go out and I invest and I hire. And by the way, I'm not going to be able to maintain that stock price unless I maintain the earnings growth. And once one CEO in each industry decides to turn on the light switch, we're going to see CEOs, follow, all CEOs follow suit, and we're going to go from 75,000, 80,000 in monthly job growth to 150,000, 200,000, 250,000, 300,000 in monthly job growth. And it's going to happen almost literally overnight. We're going to be surprised at how quickly that occurs. So reason number two for optimism is that corporate America is very, very strong, very strong. Reason number, how are you feeling? Better, right. I knew the corporate earnings thing would really get you going. Yeah. If I was giving this speech in Des Moines, it wouldn't really resonate as well, but I know here in this room uh, that would work. Reason number three for optimism. W would you mind if I take my jacket off? It's very hot, is it okay? I, I notice you guys are all very formal, but is that okay? I noticed Vishan, no matter how, how uncomfortable he was, he wasn't going to take off his... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm taking this off, though. The lady's going to say, Dad, how could you do that? Now she's going to say, Dad, how could you say that? Where was I? Oh, reason number three for optimism. We are righting the wrongs that got us into this mess. The most fundamental reason for this mess we're in are the millions of bad loans we made in the boom and the bubble, and we're well on our way to working through those loans. We still have a foreclosure crisis. We still have a couple million first mortgage loans to work through, but we've worked through two-thirds of the problem loans that were out there uh, at the beginning of the, of the economic crisis. And the deleveraging process that households are now going through, the reduction in their debt, which is a significant weight on consumer spending, will come to an end about this time next year. The key statistic for determining the end of household deleveraging is the household debt service burden, the proportion of after-tax income that households must devote to their interest and principal payments to remain current on their debt. At the current rate of deleveraging, if that occurs for one more year, the deleveraging that occurred over the past year occurs for one more year, and interest rates remain where they are, which is a reasonably good bet, then a year from now, the household debt service burden will be near a record low. And if deleveraging continues for another year and a half and interest rates remain where they are, a year and a half from now, the debt service burden will be indeed at a record low. At that point in time, in my view, the deleveraging process will come to an end. We'll go from massive reductions in debt. I'm not arguing that we're going to get significant increases in credit. People aren't going to go out and borrow aggressively again. But simply going from significant declines in, uh, de uh, de uh, in debt deleveraging to no deleveraging is the lifting of a significant weight on consumer spending on an economic activity. And that's going to happen just about this time next year into early 2012. One more reason for optimism. The level of economic activity, as I've alluded to earlier, is incredibly low relative to any demographic, households, population, age composition of the population. And at some point, we're going to see a significant unleashing of what is developing, what I would call that's developing is called pent-up demand. So let me uh, illustrate this point in the case of the vehicle market. The vehicle, we're selling vehicles at an annualized rate of about 11.5 million units. In a normal, well-functioning economy, if everything was functioning uh, appropriately, we would be selling somewhere between 15.5 to 16 million units. So right now we're selling at well below trend, understandably so, the problems in the job market, the lack of credit, the lack of confidence. But as soon as we get a little bit of job growth, a little bit of credit, and a little bit of confidence, we're going to see a significant pickup in vehicle sales go back closer to its demographic trend 
and then probably beyond that. People are pulling back on their purchases. They, they demographically would like to buy. There's, their families are growing and, and aging, and they would like to go out and purchase things. Historically, they have, but they're not doing that now because they're nervous. But once they're more confident, they're going to step up and go out and spend a lot more. We're going to see a lot of economic activity generated by this unleashing of pent-up demand in the vehicle market, through other kinds of consumer durables, and even in the housing market, even in the housing market. So reason number four for optimism is the fact that the level of economic activity is very, very low relative to any measure of demographics. And demographics don't mean a whole lot in any given year, but they mean everything over periods of three to five to 10 years. They are very, very important to uh, economic growth, and they're on our side. How are you feeling now? A little bit better? Okay. Point number four, the last point, and I'll end here. For my optimism to come to pass, there are a number of working assumptions that have to hold. In fact, there are a fair number of working assumptions that have to hold. I'm not going to go through them, but I'm going to mention two because they're very important. The first working assumption is that our economy broadly has to make a graceful transition away from a consumer-led economy to an economy that's led by exports and business investment. That high-income households, they're focused on their net worth. They know they don't have much time before retirement. They can see that the fiscal commission is trying to scale back Social Security and lifting the retirement age. And they need to save more. Lower middle income households, they can no longer borrow like they did because of the situation that we're in. They can no longer uh, borrow and spend beyond their income. They can no longer dissave. Consumers have been the engine of global economic growth for 25 years. They've allowed their saving rate to decline steadily throughout that period. The Great Recession, the period we've just gone through, is an inflection point for the US consumer the consumer will continue to spend, but will not spend beyond their income. They'll spend less than their income. Saving rates will rise. If this is the case, then if we're going to enjoy the kind of growth rates that we have in, uh, ex experienced historically, we need another source of growth. And that source of growth, in my view, is selling what we produce to the rest of the world, exports, and then investing here in the United States to be able to produce the things to export to the rest of the world. And if you're an American company that survived what we went through, then you must be doing something right. You have to have a market niche. You have to have a, a very competitive cost structure. And we do many things right. We export many things very successfully, and we will continue to do that. Aerospace, computer technology, software, sophisticated instrumentation, materials, pharmaceuticals, um, uh, agricultural products, processed foods. And also, going forward, we're going to export things that we've been doing for many, many years, long before anyone else on the planet, and we do them really, really well. Services, architectural services, engineering services, <laughs> management consulting <laughs> services, yes, financial services, financial services, legal services, economic consulting services. <laughs> Right? I, I make models that the European banks are using in their stress tests. I produce those models in suburban Philadelphia because it's the best place to find the most qualified people to produce those models for the rest of the world. Bank of China uses my models. I wish they would use them more, but uh, you know, they are using them. Using. <laughs> Services embody our comparative advantage as a nation, our educated and skilled workforce. That is what makes this country great. It's our people and services embody the best and the brightest. And we are going to do, we've been doing it for years. We will continue to do it. And we're going to sell those things to the rest of the world. And it's going to drive employment and economic growth long into the future. This is a working assumption. This has to happen in a reasonably graceful way. We have to make this transition. Working assumption number two. And here I'll end. And this, this is an assumption you may not buy into, but I'm going to try my best. Anyone want to take a guess at what the working assumption number two is? It's the elephant, the big elephant in the room. 
It's our fiscal situation, right? In my view, policymakers had no choice in how they responded to the financial crisis and the Great Recession. You can take exception to any individual aspect of the response, but the total totality of the economic response was, in my mind, incredible. It was unprecedented, and it worked. If they had not done what they did, we would be in a measurably worse place today. Now, as they say in economics, there is no such thing as a free lunch. It cost us, right? The fiscal stimulus, when you add it all up, was $1.1 trillion. The budget deficit in fiscal year 09 was $1.4 trillion. The fiscal year uh, 2010 budget deficit was 1.3%, 9% of GDP. Our problems are very serious. We have to address them. We have to address them. But I'm here to say that I think we will. We will. The key reason, a couple key reasons for this optimism. One is our problems are not as serious as we think. They're serious, but they're not overwhelming. Let me give you some, let me do some arithmetic for you. In fiscal year 2010, the $1.3 trillion budget deficit was 9% of GDP. In a reasonably well-functioning economy, the budget deficit, the cyclically, so-called cyclically adjusted budget deficit is 5% of GDP. We're going to go from 9% to 5% over the next couple, three years if my script holds in any reasonable way. Fiscally sustainable budget deficit, that deficit that we need to uh, get to to be sustainable so that we can make our interest payments so that they don't balloon out and swamp us is 3% of GDP. We need to go from 5% of GDP to 3%. That's a two percentage point gap, right? To put that in dollar terms, that's $300 billion per year right now. We have to close the $300 billion budget gap. Now, that's a big number, but that's doable. That's doable. Now, just for context, Iran and Afghanistan are costing us $100 billion a year. Now, as a prudent, if you're a prudent budgeter, you would assume we're going to spend $100 billion forever in Afghanistan and Iraq. But, you know, maybe we get lucky at some point in time. But nonetheless, just for context. So how are we going to close that gap? Well, the fiscal, the chairman, the, 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 the uh, two chairmen of the bipartisan fiscal commission reported out yesterday and their proposal on how to close the gap. And you know what? They have it pretty much just right. We need spending restraint and we need tax cuts. On the tax side, we need to focus on the tax deductions. Uh, mortgage interest comes to mind pretty quickly. And on the spending side, we need to focus on medical care costs and Social Security. And I think, in fact, when it's all said and done, that's precisely what we're going to do. We're going to close that $300 billion gap by focusing on those simple things. It's not going to happen in 20. 12, 2011 or 2012, but in the next presidential term, I think we're going to find the political will to do it. And one final point. We don't need, the United States does not need to close its budget gap, that $300 billion budget gap, in one year. We're not Greece. We don't need to close it in three to five years. We're not France or Germany. We're the United States of America, and we have latitude because every time we've gotten into difficulty, and we have gotten many times in the past in difficulty, we have always figured a way out, and global investors know that. If there's a problem anywhere on the planet, including in the United States, global investors come to the United States. Where else can you, we're buying a 10-year treasury bond at 2.5%, and, and even if the Fed didn't have your back, it would be 3 or 3.5%. Three we have time. We don't have to close a $300 billion budget hole in one year, three years, or five years. We've got five to 10 years. That's 30, 60 billion dollars a year. That is very doable. We can do that without affecting our long-term economic growth prospects, and we will be just fine. We will be just fine. How's that for an uplifting ending? <laughs> Nishan is saying to himself, thank goodness he didn't use the PowerPoint. I took off my jacket just for you. Thank you. I, it's just, it's amazing. You know, there's a, um, I, I love, what's that? Two guys without a jacket. Two guys without a jacket. <laughs> there's an incredibly intelligent but slight geekishness that I just love about you. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's very kind of you. I really no, no, appreciate no, that is, comment. I like the geekishness this part. Is, this yeah. is Columbia University. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Do we have some questions for uh, Dr. Zandi? Dan Dokhtaroff. 
This is a plan, by the way. Yeah, this is a plan. But well, we don't know yeah. what he's going to ask. Yeah, we don't know what he's going to ask, right? Yeah. He wants to know about the Yankees. Why didn't they? Are you a Yankees fan? Yeah. yeah. Why didn't they win the World Series? I really want to know why the Phillies didn't win the World Series. I don't know. Yeah. So here, here's my question. My question is, in, you spoke for, let's say, 25 minutes. It might have been a few minutes longer. <laughs> can only imagine what it would have been if you had the PowerPoint. But no, in, in, in that entire time, you did not mention the word Obama once. So my question to you is, is the president now irrelevant? And if not, what's the one thing that you think over the course of the next year to two that he realistically could do that would affect things in a positive way? Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that he was going to ask that question. That's a good, very good question. Um, pardon me? I haven't said anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, the geekishness part is taking over, and I'm trying to uh, formulate my response. I'll, I'll respond in two ways. First is, uh, I do not think that there will be any major economic policy made in the next two years. That, from that perspective, uh, I would say that the administration is irrelevant, yes. Uh, that in the wake of the midterm elections, the political environment has shifted to the degree that I think it will be very difficult to do anything of major consequence. The only, the only uh, reason I would be wrong uh, in that statement is if things go badly wrong. If we start going south, nothing crystallizes the thinking of even a Tea Party member than losing the election, and they would if the economy goes south. So that would uh, jumpstart some policy making. But other than that, you know, if the economy sticks roughly to the script I laid out, I don't see any significant economic policy making. Now, I, I will say, tangentially, that there is an upside to that in the context of my policy, uh, argument about policy uncertainty. I do think there is some advantages to having a policy timeout so that we can cross the T's and dot the I's on health care reform and financial regulatory reform, nail down the tax code, and provide that clarity that business people need to go out and start to expand and to, to invest. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's uh, the fact that we're not going to have any major economic policy, you know, it does make me a bit nervous in the context of the risks that we face, but it does have some advantages that could, that could uh, uh, help support the recovery going forward. Now, having said that, uh, if, if the sec really the second part of your question is, what could he do that would be of substance going forward? In my view, it would be if he was very courageous and took a step outside of his own party and led the way. Let me give you a case in point. Uh, George Bush number one, uh, the president in 1990, said, I'm not going to raise taxes. There's no, no, no read my lip pledge. And he broke that pledge. He raised taxes. And in my view, that courageous event led the, found, led the way and, and laid the groundwork for a decade of fiscal re restraint discipline that led to a budget surplus by the end of the decade. Now, clearly, President Clinton followed on. He was courageous in his own way uh, and uh, followed through with President Bush. But President Bush gave up his second term in many respects because he did that. And I think if President Obama did the same thing and took that chance, he may very well, well win the election because, in my view, the economy in 2012 is going to be very different than the economy in 1992. The, the economy is going to be at his back. It's not going to be in his face, as it was this year or was, as it was in 1992. But if he took that chance, it would really lay the groundwork for him doing something very sub substantive uh, in actually uh, hitting my bogey in 2013 and, doing, and, and making those changes that I think we need to make. And in fact, I'll say this. Uh, I didn't mention President Obama, but I think he's up to it, and I think, in fact, he will, will go down that path, that he will do something that is outside the box uh, for him and for his party, uh, and that will lead the way and show the, we need a leader, we need leadership now, and that will be the leadership we'll need to really make uh, the changes and, and get to the optimistic outlook that I've articulated. 
and, and, and if he does that, I'm going to, I'll, I'll certainly help Mr. Bloomberg, but I will certainly also help Mr. Obama, because that would take a great act of courage to do. Okay, one or two more questions. Oh, right over here. Yes, sir. You can stand up. <laughs> Who are you, by the way? Are you a plant? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> uh, what, what's the role of net exporting countries and their future investment in the United States? And just, i.e., like China, for instance, is receiving a lot of U.S. dollars through trade. Um, where will they reinvest those dollars? And how will we see that here locally? So, so the question is, uh, how will uh, mostly emerging economies that are running relatively large current account surpluses, how will they invest uh, those funds uh, in the United States? I mean, and historically, uh, in the case of China in particular, they began buying treasury bonds, right? And then they moved on to buying mortgage securities. And in, in some respects, the fodder for the great, for the financial, pan for all those bad loans we made, the financial crisis and the Great Recession, was the flood of cash that was coming into the United States because China was, and a number of emerging, other emerging economies were coming onto the scene, and they were investing very aggressively in our fixed income, as fixed income securities, into treasury bonds driving interest rates down, and driving up housing demand, and also into mortgage securities. I think over time they become much more, uh, they become much more sophisticated investors and they've been looking for higher returns you know obviously with current yields they need in treasury and other fixed and uh, uh, less risky fixed income assets they're looking for uh, greater returns elsewhere so i think they have a, a, an increasing appetite for equity uh, real estate uh, 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 real investment in companies and assets hard assets and i think we should expect them and we should welcome their investment in all of those uh, kinds of asset classes. In fact, in my view, we should do everything we can possibly do to foster that because the closer we're tethered at the hip, the more likely that our interests are going to be aligned and the less likely we're going to start debating each other about the value of the currency and other issues that are just sidebars and start worrying about how to make both our populations you know, stronger and, and richer and more wealthy. So it, I think it would be very counterproductive to erect any barriers. We should welcome that investment and uh, embrace it because I think that'll make both our economies and the global economy measurably stronger. Did I answer your question? Not really. You want to know if they're going to buy your apartment building? Is that? Yeah. Do you feel that that's going to be a larger role in recovery or will it be a short role? The question is, will this be a, a, a play a role in the economic recovery? You know, I don't view this as a is a, something that matters in any significant degree in any given quarter or even, even in a year. This is something that's going to play out over a long period of time. That, you know, they, their, their investments are evolving over time and it's, it's, it's going to be years, decades, you know, kind of process. Not, it doesn't make a big difference, I don't think, in, in the next six, nine, 12 months. Certainly, I don't think they're going to pull out of their investments to the degree that it would be disruptive. That would be very counterproductive because they're already pretty closely tethered to us uh, at this point. Are we getting tired? Or you want well, to I'm going I'm to use director's prerogative yeah. to ask last question. Okay. Was there any truth to my reckless assertion that denser urban areas will ac are actually going to fare better? You know, I was thinking about that. I, I, uh, I have to think about that some more. I mean, it's an intriguing idea. Uh, it makes sense, intuitive sense. But I, it, can I reserve uh, an opinion All on right, that? All right, so yeah, we'll wait for the analysis yeah, on that. I think it's a but I think we should probably let class out. Thank I think you. They want to it was go a pleasure. Party. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.